as we are, and even more so. Because it is only through the power of God's Spirit that we can actually put on the plate. That's what's incredible. And the plate itself is a gift of God. The ability to put on the plate is already a sign that God is acting in our hearts. So, you have to complete it. Yes? For me, it's um, Jesus knowing that he was going to die on the cross said to me, do this in memory of me. Because in the past, I always thought that that statement was for the priest. Oh, the yes, 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 but yes, yes. now it just makes it feel as if it's a more personal relationship. Yes. Talking to that's you. very interesting. Yes, yeah. 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 yeah, and that's very interesting what you're saying. You see, because, because sometimes the Last Supper has been presented as kind of, well, it is the institution of the priesthood, you know, so this is the beginning of the priesthood, it's true. But, but what Jesus is doing is he's giving this gift not just to the apostles, he's giving it to his church. And it is his church, all the believers, all the baptized. St. Thomas Aquinas once said that one of the points of baptism is to make us able to celebrate the Eucharist. He, does, he didn't say to receive communion, to celebrate the Eucharist. We don't celebrate it the same way the priest does. The priest's role is essential. Without the priest, there can be no Eucharist. But his role is not the only one. It's with the people of God. So it's the whole people that does this. We are all called to this. This is, this is the, the invitation that Jesus gave to all his disciples. To all the baptized. And that's why Christian initiation, how is Christian initiation completed for an adult? Well, for children too, except it's spread over years. But for an adult who wants to become a, a Catholic, what happens? The, the, at the Paschal Vigil, they, they are, the water is poured on them, they are baptized. The oil is poured on them, they, anoint, they are anointed. And then they gather around the table of the Lord for the first time to do what Jesus did. To, to with their brothers and sisters, put on, like I say, this play where we take off the bread and the wine and we give thanks and the bread is broken and then it is shared. And in this, this their initiation is complete. Now for the first time, they are loving what Jesus has them And they'll keep on doing it. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear that. You realize that it's not just for the priests, it's really not just for the priests, but for all the people of God. That's good. That's good. Yes? We we're very fortunate to be able to go physically to church, and the wonderful thing is to give glory to God. And at the same time, I never realized that the problem are some of them. You never, that, that, that aspect, huh? That, that actually, yes, we're giving glory to God and it's giving us something, but have we realized that we're actually having an impact in the world? This is a very, very mysterious way. There's, there's, a, there's a wonderful theologian that, that the Pope loves very much. Benedict the 16th really loves this theologian by the name of Hans Urs von Balthasar. He's got a wonderful name, huh? <laughs> One of these Swiss. Are there any Swiss here tonight? <laughs> uh, so, so I'll say. <laughs> and anyway, um, from Balthasar said once that who knows which war did not occur because of the prayer of a little girl? Who knows which war did not occur because of the prayers of a little girl? That's the mystery. That's the mystery. We don't. But we believe that somehow what we are doing by uniting our praise to the praise of Jesus on the cross, somehow the church itself is in the midst of the world acting as a sacrament of salvation for the world itself. For all those people who do not know Jesus and are not here. Somehow. We are having an impact in the world. Yeah. Anything, anything else that somebody wanted to share that struck them? Yes? For me, in a sense, it makes me, uh, how can I say, it? 
faith builder in the sense like that. In the law of the Old Testament, there was the Holocaust. In the desert, whenever the people would sin, Moses just put up the snake on the stick and then he looked at it. So God honored that and he did that. And now Christ uh, fulfilled it with his body and his blood, and God honors it and he is there to the cup of his Holy Spirit. Yes. And God. Yes. Yes. Yes, you're, you're connecting, what you're doing is connecting all the Old Testament rituals uh, in, into showing how in the, the ultimate sacrifice of Christ on the cross, all those rituals are brought to their fulfillment. They're all brought to their fulfillment. And to such a fulfillment that all we can do is share in that fulfillment. There's nothing we can really add to it. So that, you know, uh, Mass, every time we celebrate Mass, it adds nothing to the fullness of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. That sacrifice is the perfect, it fulfills all. What happens is that fulfillment is so great that it kind of spills over into our present. And that is what is made present in the Eucharist. It, we, we say the, the, the Council of Trent, for those who are interested, the great Council of Trent, the early 16th century said that the mass is a representation of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. But that word representation needs to be taken in the fullness of its sense, a representation, a making present, a representing. So that what happened 2,000 years ago, because it is done in the spirit, is eternal. It's not just a past event. It is eternal, an eternal event. And because it is eternal, it can, can be present to us today. That's an incredible thought when we think about it. Are there any more okay. yeah. It's something I discovered a few years ago when you said it. The, the whole Eucharistic prayer during the year of the Eucharist, Father George's orders and brochures about this. And one of the ones we have talked with the Eucharistic prayer beauty and you know, everything that you said. From that time on, I've, I think people think I'm anal, but it's like, give me my message and I follow it, so my mind isn't going everywhere. And, and I try to go to daily mass, so I hear it a lot, and it, it is. It's every day, it's beautiful. Yeah. If you pay attention and follow it, and realize it's like you're saying, that yeah. it's a prayer to God. Right, right. <laughs> now, it, it does, you know, it, it, it does require discipline, huh? yeah. you know? Yeah. Because it's like, um, I've, been, I've been to Stratford, you know, sometimes to see plays, Shakespearean plays. And and I know that there are evenings where the actor, you know, he's played this role by that time 123 times, nights in a row. So he knows exactly where he's going to put his foot. He knows exactly what he's going to say. He knows exactly the intonation he's going to use. It must become boring after a while, right? So it really means the actor to every time he comes to tell himself, okay, I have to do this as if it was the first time. I have to put myself back into this role. I've got to make that effort, that discipline. It's the same thing for us when we're putting on the play of the Eucharist. For me as a priest, but for all of you, you know, as participants in the celebration, to take up that second Eucharistic prayer, prayer particularly, that we say over and over and over again, you know, and to not just say it by rote. Yeah, you know. Very much we say to this and that. You know, you just, you just, it just, it just rolls off. It just rolls off. A bit like the Our Father. <laughs> Our Father, Lord in heaven, how would you know I need that kingdom come? That would be known. Our Father, in heaven, give us this care. And you can say it all, and you're not thinking at all what you're saying. I, I, this is a terrible story, but well, it's not terrible. But I, I still remember, you know, as a young priest hearing confessions. The first time, the first time I heard a, a man, you know, an elderly gentleman said, "Would you like to say the act of confession, the act of contrition?" And he says, "Wait," and he starts, you know, act of confession. I want to do the next one. I will say, "Well, please, I'll do it." 
You know, I mean, he was singing breathing in. <laughs> and, and it's a great danger that because of the familiarity of Nas that we simply do it by rote. And this is where I want to suggest to you that it is important to be able to truly celebrate the Eucharist that we need to prepare ourselves to celebrate. We need to prepare ourselves before we come. For example, I, you know, I think one of the first things people should do is try to get a hold of the readings that are going to be proclaimed at that Sunday Mass and try to understand them before they get to church. Because some of them are so complicated that there's no way in the world you're going to understand them while they're being proclaimed. And let's face it, none of us are great Shakespearean actors to take these texts of St. Paul and make them come alive you know, in front of the congregation. We're just poor readers who get up and stumble over the words and we don't make the pauses in the right place. So how are you going to understand what is being proclaimed? And today we have so many tools. Everybody's on the internet now. You know, next week will be the 18th. Is it the 18th? Next week? No, I mean, I'm off. 20, 22nd. 23rd. 23rd. No, I don't. Whatever. I'm all mixed up because Marilyn made me prepare the text for the 17th Sunday of Ordinary Time next year. Yeah. So that's why I'm on the 17th Sunday. But, but, you know, you go onto Google and you type 23rd Sunday Ordinary Time. Readings. Click on it. It'll bring you to sites where you can see the readings. And if you don't understand it, you can write in the text and say homily, and it'll bring it to a homily that will explain it. If the homily at your church wasn't good that Sunday, go to the web. You've got, you've got four, five, six great homilies there. No, really, I mean, let's face it, you're not stuck with who you've got at church that Sunday. And, and the greatest preacher in the world is going to have an off day. Right? Right? We have to put a bit of ourselves in time. So, so I think we need to prepare by we, we have to kind of place ourselves into the right spirit as we're coming to the church. You know, if I come to church and oh God, I gotta go to church again. I could be out on the golf course today. And I've got this to do and I've got that to do. No. You're giving it to God. Give it joyfully. Give it joyfully. Okay, Lord, here I am. I wish I was elsewhere. I wish I could be doing something else, but I'm here now. Here I am. Okay. You know, I'm going to give this joyfully. But the most important thing is to try to live the present moment. The distractions are not a sin. When I was a kid, I was told a distraction is a sin. I used to go to confession. It was one of the sins I confessed the most. Oh, Father, forgive me. I was distracted during Mass. I thought of the, you know, apple pie my mother was making and we had after lunch. Now that's normal. It's not a sin. It's not a sin. But, but when you realize you're being distracted, you say, God, help me. Bring me back. Bring me back. Just leave it. Just leave it. Come back. Come back to the words. Reflect on those words. But meditate. Take the Eucharistic prayer. Meditate. Some of you, some of you go to the Eucharistic chapel in a regular way. Bring, bring the missile with you, the the the, 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 the missile, and read the Eucharistic prayer. Pray the Eucharistic prayer. Start with prayer number one, and go to two, and three, and four. And pray those for the children, and pray those for special occasions, and pray those for reconciliation. You've got stuff there to pray for a year. Then start over. <laughs> Uh, what I'm saying is that to really, to really live the Mass fully, we have to give it ourselves. If, if we go...